brother P. K. Prabhakar, the Sri Satyasai Global Council of Trinidad and Tobago lovingly welcomes you to the program, to the series, Awake, Unite and Inspire. We are extremely blessed, fortunate and honored to have you as our guest on this evening's program. So brother Prabhakar, share with us, how did you first come into contact with our beautiful mother Sai? And I've seen that you came into contact with him way back in 1948 when Swami was just the tender age of 22. Sai so, Ram, uh, my humble pronouns at uh, Swami's lotus feet. Uh, may he guide my speaking. May he make me utter only words that may be of some use to others. And uh, may my ego not enter into it. Thank you, Brother uh, Pais. It is an honor and a privilege to be here and to talk about Swami. My first contact, as you mentioned, uh, with Swami was in 1948. I was four years old. Uh, I, we used to live in Bangalore. Our family lived in Bangalore. Uh, my great-grandmother was a devotee of uh, Swami. And Swami used to visit her house uh, and stay there for a, a few days uh, at a time. And she lived there with her uh, two daughters, uh, one was uh, unmarried and the other one was uh, widowed and uh, the widowed uh, daughter's two children and um, uh, my grandmother uh, she lived elsewhere and the other uh, daughter was um, was is well known in swami's circles as uh, rani of chincholi uh, her name was lakshmi bai and um, anyway yeah, so whenever swami came to my great grandmother's house um, they would ask my mother to bring some rice, uh, which we used to get uh, rice from our village because it was supposedly good rice. So to cook for Swami, they, my mother used to take the rice and, uh, um, you know, also join in the cooking and uh, Swami would be served with the food. And on one of those occasions, I, I had gone, you know, with my sister at that time. And uh, Swami was coming down from the stairs uh, and I must have been crying. I don't know why, but uh, Swami asked me, are you crying because of my hair? And then um, uh, he looked at me, he created Vibhuti and put it on my forehead and my sister's forehead. My sister was running a little bit of a fever at that time. And uh, she, he created an orange, he materialized an orange and gave it to her. I, I can remember this, uh, this scene very well. You know, it's sort of, I've played it in my mind, <clears throat> excuse me, many times over. Uh, so that was the very first contact I had with um, uh, Swami's physical form. And uh, my aunt tells me, you know, my school, I go from my house to uh, the school I was in, the kindergarten, I had to pass in front of my great-grandmother's house. And my aunt tells me that somehow I used to drop in at the time that Swami was there. And, you know, I would get candy and things like that. I was four years old at that time. <laughs> I'm not an old man like I am now. Uh, so that was my uh, first uh, uh, interaction with Swami, uh, Sai Ram. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Brother Prabhakar, at such a tender age of four. But your great-grandmother, look at the darshan, the blessing, and the opportunities that she had with Swami actually staying at her home for many days. So what a tremendous blessing, not only for you, but for the entire family for generations before. Thank you very much for sharing. So at the tender age of four, you came into contact with Swami. And 
I am sure you would have had many, many memorable experiences over the years because Swami, through his divine grace, his will and his love, uh, blessed you with many interviews, interviews and darshans throughout the years. But can you select, and I know sometimes this is difficult for devotees to do, having had so many wonderful experiences, but can you select and share at least two of the most memorable ones you've had with our beloved Mother Sai? You know, Faiz, that is the most difficult question in, in one sense. Is, uh, you know, from the age of four, uh, maybe, you know, from from the age of four to maybe around 12 or 13, uh, you know, Swami was not so much in my consciousness. But after the age of 13, when we actually, the first time we went to Puttavarthi, uh, and Swami, uh, you know, uh, saw us and uh, uh, gave us an interview. And uh, of course, this was much earlier than before the crowd started coming and so on. Uh, from that time onwards, until to this day, and I kid you not, until to this day, Swami is a presence all the time, you know, and it's very hard to pick out uh, two uh, instances. Uh, I gave it a lot of thought after you sent me those questions. And I, I come to this uh, conclusion, at least I'll, I'll relate one uh, instance. Uh, uh, the first one is, um, you know, whenever there was a, an occasion, uh, whether it is a marriage or uh, even my tonsils operations, <laughs> we would go to Swami, right? It's a, so that's how it was. And uh, before I came to this country in 1967, I had uh, gone to uh, Swami uh, to tell him that I'm uh, coming to America, you know. So he called me and um, uh, he, you know, he gave me a lot of advice. And uh, uh, I, I think it was in that interview, I don't know whether this interview or in another interview, he uh, told me to recite the Gayatri Mantra uh before uh, during the shower and he told me that just as the uh, water uh, cl cleanses you on the outside the gayatri mantra will cleanse you on the inside uh, and he said do it at least three times uh, when you're having a shower and you know uh, yeah he, at that time anyway the uh, interview room was uh, uh, fairly small and it was without any any embellishments. He didn't have anything in his room. Not even a chair at that time. And next to it was a, like a landing at the bottom of a stair. And there was a green curtain separating that landing piece from the uh, interview room. Swami was standing on the vestibule and the, you know, the partition between the two. And I was in that uh, three foot by three uh, uh, landing. And, you know, whenever, of course, in all the interviews before that, Swami was just so close. You could touch his hair. You could touch him. You know, it's like, I still remember it. And it's, um, now, the that that is one important part because I continue to do that, uh, the, uh, the recitation of Gayatri. And, uh, you know, we, when I take a walk, which I do m most days, uh, I uh, do at least one mala of uh, Gayatri Mantra. Uh, but um, I also, you know, I taught uh, Balvikas uh, for several years. And uh, I don't know whether all my students follow this, but I told them, look, Swami told, told me this directly. So you should all do it. And many of those students are doing it, and I hope they keep it up. You know, that is one part of it, which is continued. You know, the that impact of that has continued and continued to possibly the next generation. The other thing that happened was, and then I asked Swami for a picture because uh, he had just a couple of months earlier we had come 
uh, with my sister and he had given her a picture. So I asked him for a picture. He said, okay, I'll give you a picture. You wait outside, I'll call you in. So I waited outside and then Swami called me in. And um, he materialized a, a picture for me. It's a, you know, like a, 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 almost like a business card it was. And um, he made me stand next to one of the committee members uh, from a part of Karnataka state in India. And the gentleman was uh, talking to Swami and saying about all the politics in the uh, uh, centers and uh, uh, what to do and so on. Swami advised him, do all work as if it's my work. You know, don't think of yourself. Do it as your work, as my work. And, you know, in Samiti, there will always be politics. Don't worry about it. I'll, Swami will take care of it. But he said one thing which uh, sort of stayed in my mind. He says, Manava Seva is Madhava Seva. That is service to man is service to God. So that, uh, you know, he says love all, serve all. So that service part of it stuck with me. And uh, with uh, Swami's grace, we were able to, in our center, begin service for the homeless uh, back in uh, 1988 or 89, uh, the, we go and serve the homeless in Philadelphia area. Uh, we give them coffee, donuts, and sandwiches um, directly in their hands. They line up. It's um, and we give, we give it to them where they are. You know, so, so that has continued and um, uh, many of the other seva activities uh, have. Uh, directly stem from what Swami told me in that interview. So both the Gayatri Mantra and the service part of it uh, was uh, what has had a lot of impact from that particular interview, uh, uh, you know, to answer your question. That's one interview. This, uh, the other interview was uh, much earlier, actually. Um, I was uh, still in engineering college in, um, in Madras, in IIT Madras. And I had gone with a friend of mine and Swami had called us for an interview. And uh, Swami told me that uh, you want to marry a girl of your choice. Uh, your parents are looking for a girl for you. Uh, and but don't worry, Swami will take care of it. Now, I got out of it thinking, what is Swami talking about? I almost lost faith in Swami at that time. You know, I said, Swami is just a psychologist. I must be looking older than I am. You know, I was about 20 years old at that time. I must be looking older than my age. And Swami is like a good psychologist. He thought, uh, you know, this is what all Indian kids go through at that age. He told me that. And I came away, you know, and then I, 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 I forgot about it. But lo and behold, it was uh, in 1969. I, I saw him in 1965 when he told me this. And in 1969, I actually met my wife in Cincinnati, Ohio, in North America. She happened to be a, a Zoroastrian from Pakistan. And, you know, we decided to get married. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we both went back to our respective parents. You know, I went back to uh, my parents' place. And, uh, of course, they were expecting me in 1970 back to India. And they were, uh, they had lined up a few uh, girls to for me to... <laughs> Uh, interact with and so on and of course when I announced this they were uh, my father was a little upset uh, my mother kept thinking you know she's from a different religion how will she adapt and so on then of course 
as usual, we went to Swami. <laughs> so Swami uh, uh, talked to us and he said, um, you know, I was uh, working on my PhD at that time and I was very distracted, as you can imagine. And he told me, you know, watch studies. You're not you're distracted. You know, you have to learn to control your senses. He gave me a little bit of scolding. But then he said, he told my mother and all religions are the same to me. It doesn't matter, you know. Uh, he, so he had no objection to our uh, getting married. Uh, and uh, my parents were, you know, <laughs> calmed down afterwards. And, um, you know, my wife, she had not heard of Swami. She had not known about gurus and so on. She was, you know, the Zoroastrians have a fairly um, traditional uh, thing, uh, fairly conservative in that way. So uh, when we moved to Ann Arbor and uh, when Saroja Giri Shankar, we met her and we were going to start uh, the center. She was not involved in it at all. And I used to take my oldest daughter for uh, bhajans in Saroja's house and we had bhajans in our house. But Swami, true to his word, he took care of it. He came to her in his dream. To this day, I don't know what he did. She totally changed and said, I am, you know, and she's been the backbone of the center, which we have had, uh, you know, we, which we have been initially participant in and later on hosted it for almost uh, 46 years now. And she's the one who reminds me of all the things to do. She knows all the festivals, all the <laughs> things to do for the center. So Swami has taken care of that, right? So these are two very, uh, uh, let's say, very meaningful things that uh, uh, introduced, uh, that resulted in all this. Thank you so much, Brother Prabhakar. That, that was really lovely, very inspiring, very blissful. Uh, Swami, first with the Gayatri and then the opening of the center and then getting... Um, getting you married and this dream that happened but i am i i still want i'm still intrigued about your personal experiences having come into contact with swami at the tender age of four so please share another two more of these memorable experiences that you've had with swami it's bringing so much joy and bliss to our hearts Okay, I, I I will. There's so so many of those that I I can't uh, you know I I can tell you one thing. Uh, uh, before I came, I listened to your uh, uh, talk, and I could totally empathize with your the situation where you had the accident. Swami has saved me on three occasions from certain death. You know, the first one. I had even, you know, in 1971, that's when I got married uh, in this country. Uh, uh, my uh, sister was living in Ithaca. Uh, I was living in Ann Arbor. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we were living in Ann Arbor. So, you know, around Thanksgiving, around uh, November time frame, it's a tradition in the U.S. for uh, families to get together. So we decided we'll drive to uh, Ithaca in New York State uh, from Michigan. Now, Michigan uh, is a state where you get a lot of snow. Luckily, we didn't get much snow that, uh, that day. We, we were leaving in the evening, and we had to go pass through uh, 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 near Cleveland. There's a long bridge uh, near Cleveland and it, it, it spans the Kahoyoga River. And I had a, a super beetle at that time. I was driving, it was a stick shift. I was driving, it was around 11 o'clock, 11.30 in the night. And suddenly my car started swinging. I tried to control the skid because the bridge had become completely ice. You know, 
because of the cold weather and the snow and so on. It just spun and uh, it was at right angles to the road. There was a guardrail at the end of the uh, lane and below that was a gorge. The, the Cuyahoga River was deep down and we were headed straight into the guardrail. It was going to fall down. I thought to myself, who's going to tell people at home what happened to us? Maybe they'll look at my wallet and find out and somehow trace our parents. I thought that is done. It is over. But then it was as though something hit the car, you know, and the car suddenly swung around, went and stalled on the, uh, uh, the, the median in the opposite direction. And we were just recovering from that. Then another car came, it spun around and was almost going to hit us. So, but we were saved and we lived to tell the day. That was the first time Swami actually saved my life. And I can't say, you know, I didn't receive the confirmation like you did, but I can't, you know, I can still feel that, that force that hit the car. It's like this. Nothing else could have hit the car, you know. Uh, and I, I lived to tell the day. The second time I had an accident uh, was uh, this was a uh, even more uh, astounding in the sense that I thought Swami was actually physically there. Uh, uh, in Bangalore, I don't know if you remember uh, if you've gone to Bangalore or not. In Bangalore, there was an old airport, not the new airport now. It was a very old, uh, uh, small airport. I had gone to buy a ticket for my daughter who was going to spend a, a week with another devotee's daughter. And my son and I were in an auto rickshaw and came out of uh, the uh, airport and we turned onto a main road. We turned onto the main road and the auto rickshaw driver was driving and the, you know, in a normal auto rickshaw, the way he does. Then uh, uh, suddenly there was a scooter uh, guy who just moved back, uh, moved onto the ro road. So in order to uh, uh, avoid him, the scooter driver moved and then to straighten up the scooter, he turned it and he turned it so fast that the entire scooter uh, fell down on the side and I was sitting on the left, it fell on the left and uh, you know, it dragged. So my the flesh from my uh, leg came out and my son fell on me and uh, uh, fortunately, you know, everybody was uh, it, it, it there intact with uh, <laughs> their life. And then there was some man who came uh, and he, he took, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in India, they call it soda. You know, it's just basically soda and poured it on my wound. And, you know, he held me and took me into the, uh, there was fortunately in front of a hospital. Took me into the hospital. And I tell you, a, for that entire moment, at time I was there, I didn't feel any pain. I was in the most peaceful state that I ever <laughs> I'd never been in, a, you know. And my, in, I was interested in making sure that the auto rickshaw driver was okay. My son was okay, and uh, the guy who had come with me, he was telling me what to do. This is all past lives karma, but it will go away. You know that you paid it off. And and once the doctor came, he bandaged me and all that. I was uh, looking for the gentleman. I am not there. And um, I asked him his name. His name, he said, was Kashi. Uh, as long as he was present in that room, I felt that sense of total peace. You know. Uh, and of course, afterwards, the doctor came. And it also happened to be the hospital, which had originally been located in Whitefield, uh, the doctor who was in charge of the hospital had given it to Swami. The Whitefield Hospital was given to Swami by this doctor and he had started another one. 
So it was a lot of coincidences. And the uh, a prelude to that also is that, you know, I just could not get a, a place inside Whitefield Ashram at that time. So I, no matter how much I tried, I could not get a place to stay. And I was looking for places outside. But once I had this injury, they were able to put me back inside the house, <laughs> ashram. So that was a bonus out of it. <laughs> that was the second time. The third time, I, I'm sorry, I'm going on and about this, but this is very meaningful. The third time, you know, I was uh, working in New Jersey. I used to park the car in some place in the parking lot and walk to my office. And as I walked to my office, it was in my uh, habit to recite the Mrityanjaya Mantra and Swami's name and Gayatri and all that. As I'm walking, there's a, a van that came out of the highway and just knocked me over. You know, it hit me completely and ran over me. Um, uh, so much so that my shoes came off and uh, I was totally unconscious. There's a pool of blood all over. And um, the next thing I know, uh, several hours later, I'm waking up in a hospital with a bunch of my colleagues singing bhajans. And I joined the bhajans with them. Uh, you know, I, I, I stayed in the hospital for about five days and I, I couldn't uh, go to work for about five months because see, there's a lot of injuries you know, uh, in the head and part of the reason I got bald, you know, and, uh, but I'm alive today with no broken bones, nothing, doing all the normal stuff. So the three times Swami, you know, he has saved me. There's nobody else who could have saved me from this. Uh, the newspaper heading was Miracle on Perry Street. Uh, you know, I can go on and on. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, so, brother, I, I think I think that is that is really amazing. On three occasions, Swami saved your life, and uh, what an an ocean of compassion, protection that He has had over your entire life, and even your parents, grandparents. So. Such a blessing, and and it is so. Uh, you know, when you were talking about deceiving, it also reminded me of what happened in my accident. So, um, it is all His divine grace and compassion. And I had also lost consciousness, and I had also wow. felt absolutely no pain, just like you did. So, some of our that death experience, that accident experience, was similar. Yes. to what you also experienced. So thank you so much for sharing, brother. So share with us, what does Sai Baba mean to you today? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, I tried to answer that question. You know, in the, I can answer it in many ways. Uh, the one thing I can say that is always been there with me. So he's a constant companion. Right? He knows my inner, innermost thoughts, the, my innermost thoughts I confide in him. Uh, he has uh, granted me my innermost uh, wishes. Uh, and, you know, it's not always uh, uh, that I thought of him as God. I used to have several discussions. Uh, you know, all my relatives, almost all my relatives are Swami's devotees. So I used to have real deep discussions on whether he's an avatar or not, whether he's God or not, whether he's just a, a Siddha or a Yogi, uh, or sometimes he's like God, sometimes he's not, you know. Uh, Especially this was in a period of when he had told me about my wanting to marry somebody and that situation was still a few years away. 
So I was questioning it and um, uh, it went on. I would have uh, periods of uh, faith. You know, mind is very fickle. Sometimes you have a lot of faith and you really feel that you uh, are very, you know, you surrender to Swami and Swami is God and all that. But at other, other times you don't. So it was in um, uh, uh, one thing that really hit me, and I remember it to this day, is this. Um, in um, Bhagavatam, which is uh, the story of uh, the Vishnu's avatars, uh, there is one section where Krishna, before he uh, leaves this world, he uh, has a conversation with his friend Uddhava. And the it is called Uddhava Gita. Huh? And the, it's a, an advice he gives to Uddhava just like he gave Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. So in the Uddhava Gita, everything that his Krishna said seemed identical to what Swami says. And then I said, oh, Swami is what he says he is, you know. And as I read Bhagavatam in elsewhere, there is, uh, there is another avatar of Vishnu called Kapila, who, uh, who was the originator of the Sankhya Yoga. Uh, he advises his mother, Devahuti, in the beginning saying, I'm your son and so on. But towards the end of his advice, he says, I am the center of the world. I am the world. I am God. So it is, uh, then I realized Swami must be who he is. So I went, you know, I, and as I keep, uh, I guess as I get, keep getting older, as time passes by, Swami in his grace is given more and more confirmation of that. And recently I re reread the Bhagavatam and what Krishna says and what the others say about Krishna in that uh, Bhagavatam is no different from Swami. You know, so it's like, to me, I, now I have I really no, I can't say I have no doubt because the next moment Swami will put a doubt in my mind. So at the moment I, I can say, you know, I, I certainly consider Swami as Bhagwan and the most ultimate, but you know, you can't define Swami. And that's why I wanted to bring this notes here. It says, he says, of vastness unknowable, of knowledge inconceivable, of love unfathomable, am I Baba. So, can't define him. He's the one I go to when I'm in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, they say, they say there are two kinds of bhakti, one like uh, Markata Kishwara bhakti, that means like a, the, the young one of a monkey, or uh, Marjara Kishwara bhakti, that means like a kitten. Now the young one of a monkey holds on to the mother uh, monkey as the monkey jumps from place to place. But the, uh, the kitten is not worried because the mother uh, kitten carry a uh, mother cat carries the kitten in its mouth. I'm still in the process of being like the monkey <laughs> all the time saying Swami, Swami, Swami. <laughs> uh, I, you know, see, there's so much of his compassion that I, I can't stop. <laughs> it's a, uh, I used to pray to Swami when, um, you know, my son, he is much more high functional now. And his younger, he's, uh, he was autistic. And he would go out and, uh, you know, clear somebody's snow or something and he wouldn't come back. Uh, and it would be arti time. And I say, Swami, at least let him come back by arti time. And lo and behold, he'll come back in arti time. So... <laughs> Little things like that and big things also. <laughs>
So, Brother Prabhakar, this is this is so amazing. This is so full of love and compassion. And as you speak, you are reliving the experiences you've had with Mother Sai. And I remember Baba says that meditation is also reliving the wonderful experiences you have had with him over the years. That is a form of meditation. And you are certainly doing that. And as you do that, you also take us along the journey with you so that we can feel if only a fraction of that joy and that bliss and that peace that you would have felt in all your divine interaction. So thank you so much for that sharing. It was really, really inspiring and blissful. So, brother, you were very much involved, you said, in teaching Baal Vikas classes for many, many years. And Swami has said in, that being an SSE teacher, being a Baal Vikas teacher is one of the noblest seva that you can do simply because you are grooming and preparing the young minds uh you are molding the character so than preparing them to be good citizens in the society so share with us what was that what was the experience like uh interacting with the children and the children interacting with you as baba says it's not so much a teaching but an awakening of the human values that already exist within the child. So both the, both the guru and, and the children benefit and are transformed. So share with us the experience you've had over the years in Balvikas and what it has taught you and how it has transformed you as well as the children. You know, teaching Balvikas, one thing that you have to do is i i always felt this is that you yourself have to be very clear about what you're teaching right? in the sense that I, I, maybe i should put it this way that as much as possible your heart has to be pure you know swami says you teach all religions to children right and you yourself cannot have any prejudices against any particular uh, religion or uh, uh, some kind of a jingoism about your own religion. That is one thing that it makes you universal in the first place. You know? And the children are so innocent uh, that their purity comes to you in a way. It's a kind of an interaction, you know. Uh, it was the most delightful experience that I've had. The My last uh, Balvikas teacher left the uh, Oh, I'm sorry, my phone is acting up. I just. The, the feedback from the children, their innocence, getting them to, uh, you know, their questions, their curiosity. Uh, it made me think even more, right? So I was better off. Uh, I learned a lot more from the children uh, than, uh, you know, I, I wonder if the children learned any more from me, you know. Uh, what I found, the, uh, the example you set as a teacher in the Balvikas is what... Uh, carries through to them because we were involved in the uh, regular seva activities and the children participated in the seva activities once they grew up they went to uh, they took jobs and went to various uh, uh, cities they started these kinds of activities themselves and so the seva activities that we started here continues in other cities in other in other places you know and many of them are have become ardent swami devotees um, you know uh, many of them come back to the center just to have the old feeling of being in the center uh, 
the children have become friends to each other, uh, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, their children have become friends to each other. So it's a, uh, in, in summary, I think it, it purified me, it purified my, uh, my own mind and made me learn a lot more um, spiritually, grow me, grow a lot more spiritually. It made me think a lot more before I taught anybody anything, you know. So I don't, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but... <laughs> oh, oh, certainly. And I, I, I love what you said, that to be an effective teacher, you have to be a good example. And that is what is most important uh, in when we interact with our children as SSC teachers, as parents, as Balvika's gurus, because the child will follow not so much what you see, but what you do. They look at your example. So that is the most powerful uh, way of teaching, most effective. And I remember in 1986, Swami said that in the EHV course, the best way to teach EHV is to live it. So be the change, walk the talk, be the example. And that alone will inspire goodness and nobility in others. So very, very beautiful indeed, brother, for sharing. And that is such an important aspect of Swami's mission, focusing 75% of his time was spent with the younger ones because the older ones were already bent and difficult to straighten. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brother Prabhakar, you also, looking at your bio data, you were initiated into Transcendental Meditation in 1973. But as you came into contact with Swami, you, you stated that it evolved into a technique taught by Swami over the years. And right. no, the second, the, the first of the nine point code of conduct is daily job and meditation, right. which focuses on the individual first. If there's righteousness in the heart, there'll be beauty in the character. So that initial first uh, nine point code of conduct is about building character in the individual first. Right. So, how did that? transcendental meditation technique, how you stated that it evolved into a technique taught by Swami over the years. So how, how were you able to transition um, from, from where you were into Swami's recommended meditation? Right. Uh, you know, in 1973, I was... Um, uh, you know, I was always interested in spirituality. I, even when I was young, uh, I, you know, at the age of 10, I read Shivananda's uh, Gita and all that. And, um, you know, I read about Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and so on. So I was very much interested in uh, meditation and how to uh, overcome the, the vagaries of the mind, let's say, you know. Uh, so when... Uh, uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi was uh, offering this technique on a, in a broad way to uh, almost anybody. Um, you know, we lived in Ann Arbor, at the Ann Arbor, Michigan at that time. I, uh, I went and uh, got initiated into Transcendental Meditation. Uh, what they gave is a Bija Mantra uh, uh, of the Vedas. And one of the first... Uh, effects of that uh, meditation itself was uh, a good one. Um, you know, I, I grew up a vegetarian, but when I came to this country in 67, I started eating meat, all kinds of meat, because, you know, I, I was not a very good cook at that time. And I ate out and I ate meat. I ate, uh, 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 you know, all kinds of meat. Uh, I consumed alcohol and so on. Uh, but after a, a couple of years of practicing the meditation, I just could not uh, eat meat 
if there was even a hint of meat anywhere I could tell, uh, I, my alcohol consumption have completely got eliminated. And in that sense, it was a purification it started in that sense. And then um, sometime in the early 80s, I think, uh, uh, in one of the retreats, I happened to be having breakfast with uh, Dr. Hislop and a um, few others. And uh, Dr. Hislop mentioned that, uh, you know, he had uh, been with uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and had learned uh, the Transcendent Meditation and he had practiced it for several years. Uh, you know, he had practiced several methods of meditation. He had also gone to Burma and learned uh, uh, the, um, uh, the insight meditation, as they call it, by uh, a monk called Saida. Uh, so he said, I didn't have any problem. Once I met Swami, I changed uh, and I adopted Swami's meditation. Uh, I was a bit uh, of two minds about it because Swami had very clearly said that, uh, uh, you know, once you've gone somewhere, you can't keep trying different kinds of uh, uh, meditations. You have to stick to one and, uh, you know, until you succeed. And um, in the in in fact in the same dream uh, uh, retreat in my dream he came and said I'm not going to give you any mantra. Uh, I asked him for a mantra and he said no. You know, so uh, in fact uh, he uh, he had given me two dreams in the in that same retreat. Uh, one was about my son and uh, how he was going to take care of him. So. I, I said, okay, Swami is not going to give me any mantra. He had given me that uh, Gayatri mantra. Should I practice with Gayatri mantra? Uh, but, uh, you know, boy, he didn't give it to me as a mantra. He said, practice it when you're having a shower, you know. So I said, uh, for a while, I continued with the transcendental meditation. But I don't know how it actually happened. I have to tell you this. It, it just automatically, I started uh, uh, doing the uh, Swami's light meditation. You know, uh, And uh, for a while, I felt good about it and continued for many, many years uh, doing Swami's meditation. Uh, and even so, I used to, at the end, picture Swami in my heart and say Swami's name. Uh, oh, meanwhile, I have to I have to back up a little bit. Uh, Swami, uh, you know, um, at one time uh, I had promised one of the youngsters, not a Swami devotee, but one of the youngsters who wanted to know a lot more about uh, Hindu customs and traditions. She should write a book I said, okay, I'll, I promised to write a book at that time you know, to her. But one day while I was walking in my office, it, like Swami came in my um, head and said, do it on Namaskaranam. So myself and uh, a friend of mine, we had compiled uh, Swami's sayings on Namaskaranam. And... Uh, actually got his blessings. We went to uh, Bharti and Swami came and blessed. Uh, he put Akshatanas and materialized the buddhi and gave it to us. And it, actually he kept it in his room. Uh, Gita Mohan told us this. He kept it in his room and then distributed it to the hosp uh, hostels. It was a compilation of Swami's uh, sayings on Namasmarana. So I had been practicing Swami's uh, saying Swami's name and uh, so saying Swami's name and visualizing his form became uh, kind of a natural way of doing it. You know, sometimes visualizing light is a little more difficult than visualizing Swami's form. Uh, at least for me, it was. Uh, uh, so I started a, now I've combined all these methods and I'm doing all three of them a, kind of in... Um, in one sitting and 
takes a little longer, but I do it and I enjoy it. My uh, day is made if I do it properly that day. You know? so, uh, Sairam, that's how it evolved. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for sharing, brother. And the light meditation, when you practice the light and meditation, because Swami has actually, in his own words, uh, told us how to practice it. Right, right. That the, the light represents that divinity, that divine love. And you, you first purify the entire body with the light, each, each of the body organs, and then you radiate it to family, friends, even those who do not like you, and then the whole world. Absolutely, yes. And, um, um, when you finish a session of that Jyoti meditation, you actually feel that that love and that bliss and that happiness yes. of Swami, you know, filling your entire being. And, you know, once you do it in the morning, it starts your day right. And you begin to, that love and that light begins to overflow and radiate in your daily activities. So it's the most beautiful meditation. And then he says it's, it involves concentration first, then contemplation, and then the actual meditation. So very, very beautiful. So spontaneously, Brother Prabhakar, I am, I don't know, Swami has put this thought in my head now to ask you this question, which is not on the list that I have sent you. Okay, no problem. And uh, you said that you got married to a Zoroastrian uh, devotee. Right. How has marriage, and you've been married, what, over 50 years, isn't it? Right, right. <laughs> yes. You've been married years. over 50 years. So how has marriage helped you in your transformation process? How has it helped you to realize that divinity or contribute to that, realizing that divinity within you, having been married for so long? What are the benefits it, that has accrued to you in marriage over the years from a spiritual perspective? You know, uh, if you don't face any obstacles, you never really know whether you are progressed, right? <laughs> so marriage is a, uh, you know, it's great, but it also has its challenges, right? And it is, especially when you come from different backgrounds, there is a, uh, a different upbringing, different views of the world. All these things are there and you have to reconcile those things. You know, now if, you are, if I live as an individual with people just like me, I will never progress, you know. You have to live with people with different ideas, different uh, ways of doing things. And, you know, as, uh, my wife is a very independent person. She has her own views on things. I have my own views on things. I can be stubborn sometimes. She can be stubborn sometimes. So how do you negotiate all these things, right? So many times, and uh, we had a challenge of bringing up a, a, an autistic child as well. And the the different approaches to uh, bringing up an autistic child uh, that itself could be a, a, an issue in marriages, right? And all these things, if I had not had Swami with me, I don't know how I would have been able to negotiate, right? And uh, she too, because she had faith in Swami, it made that possible, right? And I, I couldn't be luckiest. I'm the luckiest man, I think, because Swami has made that possible. <laughs> uh, I think uh, she's a wonderful person. She is uh, the rock of our uh, marriage. She's kept the center going. She's kept the family going. So it is the, uh, the uh, uh, whatever Swami has done is sort of brought a, given me opportunities to grow. I, I'm not uh, minimizing it because there are lots of things that we had to work out over the period of time. But 
it was possible with Swami's grace and it, you know, it develops when you are, uh, when you encounter challenges, when you overcome them, you, you have grown and the next challenge you can uh, meet with a little less um, uh, perturbation of the mind. Yeah? So the mind, you know, uh, uh, I think it, I've learned to calm the mind, I, I guess. It's uh, calming the mind. Uh, it's, um, and, and you know, brother, before you carry, uh, before you go on, you know, Swami has said um, so many things about marriage. You know, he said before marriage, there was one after marriage, and there were two after marriage, the two shall become one. The problem is which one? That's just a joke. And um, he said two souls come together in marriage in order to shatter the ego. And then he also said um, that marriage is about um, understanding first, adjustment, and then you have compromise because he says you also have to move from I being single and then when marriage comes, it goes from I to we. So you're moving from selfishness to selflessness. And then when children come, it becomes even more selfless. So it's really a, a training ground um, to shatter the ego in the sense, as you rightly said, there could be diverse views, differences of opinions. Um, your wife may one day want to do something. You want to do something else. She may want to watch a particular television show that clashes with you wanting to watch cricket. How then do you, on a daily basis, how do you maneuver? How do you navigate the situation? And Swami talks about that adjustment and understanding. Um, so these are the day-to-day -day things that help, as you rightly said, help you to grow and transform um, into uh, and make you more aware of the, the divinity within. See, you will never be able to do it by yourself. I think the family is a good learning ground for you to grow, you know. And then I guess the, the additional challenge in your um, family was having the autistic child now. So both of you all have to work together now in order to help to navigate uh, someone who is differently abled. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. With uh, Swami's grace, he's uh, highly functional, much more functional now. And he's also a very strong devotee of Swami. He does many, many malas of Swami's name. So uh, we are blessed. Swami has blessed us that way. <laughs> And uh, I remember Swami says also that marriage accelerates your karma because it brings out, it brings out in, in both parties things you never believed that were there. And yeah, I, yeah. it comes out, it, it presents an opportunity for you to confront and deal with it, you know. Right. So, um, but you've been married over 50 years and that's quite a tremendous achievement. And from what you've described, you've, you've had a marriage that has been really wonderful and blessed by Swami. Yes. So again, all by his divine grace. So, Brother Prabhakar, at the tender age of four, and now having known Swami, you've started a center, you've been involved in Balvika Steva activities for so many years. How has practicing the teachings of Sai Baba transform and continue to transform your life over the years? Ah, it's a good question. You know, it's like I... Um, I think I've actually become calmer uh, in my mind. And I'm beginning to see the inklings of what Swami talks about, right? It, partly because I think now I'm older. I mean... Uh, I'm 78, I will be 79 in February, it gives a very different perspective on life. And now I almost feel that this is all a passing show. You know, the reality that we should all strive for 
is the actual ultimate reality, the Satchidananda, you know, the uh, to realize who we are. That is really the very purpose of life, you know. Uh, at times, I'm able to watch my mind and uh, separate myself from my mind. Uh, as Swami says, watch your actions, thoughts, and so on. Uh, it is also, in some ways, you can, uh, when your mind is a little calmer, you can begin to even practice uh, uh, the Atma Vichara that uh, Ramana Maharshi talked about, right? It's a who, who am I, you know? This I consciousness is there when you are, when I was that four-year-old boy, I thought that was I. Now I am almost a 79-year-old man. I still think I'm the same I. So that I has continued, but my mind, thoughts, body, appearance, everything has changed. Uh, and all the society around me has changed. The only thing that has remained constant is the sense of I, you know. Uh, so what is this I? Is, I think it's something that we have to, uh, at least now when the storms and the turbulence of youth and middle age and the pursuit of career and money and prestige and all that is over, now is the time, we have the time to think about it to think about what is this, to inquire as to what this I is, you know, uh, to see what is transcending this ordinary consciousness, right? It's, um, uh, what is beyond these five senses? What is beyond this uh, mind? Uh, that is the uh, primary uh, goal, I would say, uh, right now of my life. So from uh, a boy who didn't know anything at the age of four, through all the struggles of a career and um, uh, marriage and bringing up children and so on, I think he has brought me to a stage where I can think of these things in a very calm, uh, unaffected way. I, I don't think I get affected too much if somebody insults me anymore uh, or if somebody uh, says anything negative about me. Nor do I, I think I get too elated. I don't know. It's uh, up to others to make that uh, judgment. But uh, in my own mind, I don't think there is a lot of uh, perturbation. You know. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Swami for it. It's uh, Without Swami, I can't do anything. It's uh, I'm nothing. You know, it is because he's there, uh, I'm able to do whatever I'm able to do. Because he's doing it anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing, brother. So you basically were saying that we have to move from that small I to the big I, the I, which is the true self. And as Swami said in a birthday message many years, he said, you must affirm, I am God. I am not different from God. I am the infinite supreme, the one reality. I am Satchit Ananda Swarupa. I am Om Tat Sat Om. And as you rightly said, that is the main purpose of our existence to realize the inherent divinity within. Everything else, everything else really has to be secondary. That has to be the top priority. And whatever we may be engaged in, that must also assist and, and help us to right. weaken that divinity within. What are your thoughts? Yes, I think the... You know, if all the activities that you perform are aligned with that goal, it will help, right? It's a, I, I think, uh, 
I'm so grateful to Swami for that. It's a, I think satsang is very important. The association you have with the people because he has given us all the benefit of a center, benefit of association with like-minded people who are all striving towards uh, uh, the goal of, uh, a, you know, devotion, self-realization. Uh, that helps. Uh, practicing meditation, uh, nama japa, uh, all these activities help. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you have to have being in this world, you have to be engaged in activity which uh, helps you materially to survive. Uh, and if you can do it with uh, uh, the dharma in uh, foremost in mind, I think, uh, as Swami said, you earn uh, artha through dharma and your kama must be for moksha. You know, uh, so that's the... Uh, I agree. I Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and as you were speaking, brother, it reminded me of what Swami said in a, a divine discourse. He says, man has to be unmade and remade with his ego destroyed and replaced by a transcendent consciousness. So sometimes we have to unlearn what we have learned. And as the Bible says, unless he become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So all our prejudices, all our conditionings, the unmaking and remaking of ourselves. And I guess that's why he says that uh, when you come to me, I hook you and then I begin to cook you and then I begin to barbecue you. <laughs> <laughs> he has cooked me and barbecued many times. <laughs> As a lot of devotees know. <laughs> and, um, you know, to become that diamond, as he said, of a, of a devotee, you have to go through the pounding and the twisting and the grinding and the baking. But in the end, you become that beautiful, bright jewel of a devotee. So thank you so much for sharing. So, Brother Prabhakar, my final question to you on this very wonderful divine interview that I'm so thoroughly enjoying and I'm sure all viewers looking at it will be inspired. The question is, you know, you look around in the society today and there is apparent chaos, misery, pain, debt, you look at the pandemic, there's economic uh, disasters. People have lost their lives. They've lost their homes. They can't afford food. So many countries, so many uh, natural disasters have been inflicted on Mother Earth through man's inhumanity to himself. But if someone were to come to you, uh, brother, and say, and say to you, brother, Prabhakaru, Look at the state of the world. What can I do as an individual to make the world a little bit more loving, a little bit more kind, a little bit more peaceful, a little bit more united? What would you share with that person? You know, I've always felt that, you know, you use the word, correct words, I think. Kindness to others, right? Say it's the, It starts with being kind and compassionate towards the people around you, right? Uh, any one individual cannot change the whole world, but you can spread your uh, kindness, compassion uh, around the uh, where you are, right? Uh, uh, even to do that, you have to, in a sense, be calm yourself. You know, you have to be in a state where you can listen to others. Nobody listens to others anymore, right? It's a listening has become a lost art. If you can just listen to somebody else's troubles, that itself will alleviate uh, a, a lot of stress in them. You know, listening to somebody else's troubles, being kind to them. Uh, and helping out whenever you can. It, it, it doesn't have to be on a large scale. 
separately uh, in a small scale around you you know um, in, in in that sense i think my autistic son has taught me a lot of things because he loves to talk and his talk is not always something that may be of any interest uh, to anybody right and he is because I am his father and I, I I feel well towards him, I listen to him no matter what he is talking about. Uh, now, if we can extend that kind of thing to, because who else? Nobody else talks to him. Uh, nobody else will listen to him. So somebody has to listen. So to that extent, uh, the person right next to you, he is relieved a little bit, right? So uh, if your wife comes and complains about things and uh, uh, the, the, the least you can do is to listen to those complaints, you know, with a calm mind and a sympathetic, a sympathetic listener is what I'm thinking about, you know, uh, that will make a big difference just in the people around you. And it spreads. See, when you... People receive some love, some kindness, some compassion. They tend to give it to others. And this network will grow. You know? So if each person, if each side devotee starts giving the... See, instead of being solely uh, worried about whether I'm singing my bhajan correctly or uh, whether I'm getting to my save on time or uh, doing enough, the attitude of kindness, compassion, and uh, love is more important, I think, you know. So if we go to uh, serve the homeless, if we see the other homeless person as a person like you, huh, and just interact with kindness and uh, uh, on an equal basis, I think that interaction will be more, uh, 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 you know, beneficial to everybody, you know. Of course, we are helping ourselves when we serve. Uh, that's uh, my two cents worth. <laughs> Thank you very much, brother. You made such an important point in your sharing that many of us have forgot how to listen. Sometimes in a conversation, we listen to respond to what the person is saying. But as you said, when, when you truly listen from an inner being, from, from, from a sympathetic no, or more empathetic view, you then begin to feel and understand what the other person is feeling. And so that alone is a saver, is a service unto itself. And sometimes... The, the saver doesn't require you to have money. Just your time and your presence can bring forth such good benefits to persons. All they want is somebody to listen to them, to, to just be there where they can outpour their misery or their, their sharing of joys or sorrows. So as Swami says, you know, the saver, wherever there's a need, is where saver should be done. And sometimes you may have a lot of wealthy people who have needs, and that is also seva. But as you said, it begins with each and every one of us. And as Swami has said, there can never be world transformation until individuals change. But if each one of us take ownership of our own space and become the best we can be, and you multiply that by three or four billion, we can have waves of transformation flowing through the world. Very true, very true. Very true. So, Brother Prabhakar, it has been an absolute pleasure, an honor, a privilege listening to your wonderful journey and transformation at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Swami. The Sri Satyasai Global Council of Trinidad and Tobago wishes to express gratitude and appreciation to you for taking the time to share your personal journey and transformation at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Mother Sai. 
May Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba continue to bless you and guide you. May you continue to be a loving instrument as his mission unfolds. Jai Sai Ram. Jai Sai Ram. Thank you, Brother Faiz. I'm deeply honored and I truly enjoyed talking to you. And may Swami continue.